celebration together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Now, if you've been standing to sing, let's sit or kneel for our prayers of confession. Let's pause for a moment and think about our day, our week, our month, and come before the Lord to say something. Come, let us return to the Lord and say, Lord our Lord, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us, deliver us from judgment, bind up our wounds and revive us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, I'm going to sing the Peruvian Gloria. I'll sing a line and then you sing with me. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to the Father. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to the Father. To Him be glory forever, to Him be glory forever. Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen. Glory to God, glory to God, Son of the Father. Glory to God, glory to God, Son of the Father. To Him be glory forever, to Him be glory forever. Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to the Spirit. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to the Spirit. To Him be glory forever, to Him be glory forever. Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen, Alleluia, Amen. Now the prayer of this week, the Collect of the 15th Sunday after Trinity. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the Gospel, that, always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service through Jesus Christ your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, if you've been standing for singing, please be seated for our Bible readings. And this week, our Old Testament reading comes from the book of the prophet Jonah, chapter 3, uh, right at the end, verse 10 through to chapter 4. 
If you have a Good News Bible, you'll find it on page 897 in the Old Testament, page 897. And this is the conclusion of the prophet's mission to Nineveh. God saw what they did. He saw that they had given up their wicked behaviour. So, he changed his mind and did not punish them as he said he would. Jonah was very unhappy about this and became angry, so he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. Now, Lord, let me die. I'm better off dead than alive. The Lord answered, What right have you to be angry? Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in its shade, waiting to see what the Lord would do to Nineveh. Then the Lord God made a plant grow up over Jonah to give him some shade, so that he would be more comfortable. Jonah was extremely pleased with the plant. But at dawn the next day, at God's command, a worm attacked the plant and it died. After the sun had risen, God sent a hot east wind and Jonah was about to faint from the heat of the sun, beating down on his head. So he wished he were dead. I'm better off dead than alive, he said. But God said to him, what right have you to be angry about the plant? Jonah replied, I have every right to be angry, angry enough to die. The Lord said to him, this plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it, and you didn't make it grow, yet you feel sorry for it. How much more then should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 21. If you're following it in a Good News Bible, you'll find it on page 246 in the New Testament part of the Bible. Page 246. Philippians, chapter 1, and I'm beginning to read at verse 21. For what is life? To me, it is Christ. Death, then, will bring more. But if by continuing to live, I can do more work while work, then I'm not sure which I should choose. I'm pulled in two directions. I want very much to leave this life and be with Christ, which is a far better thing. But for your sake, it is much more important that I remain alive. I am sure of this, and so I know that I will stay. I will stay on with you all to add to your progress and joy in the faith, so that when I'm with you again, you will have even more reason to be proud of me in your life in union with Christ Jesus. Now, the important thing is that your way of life should be as the gospel of Christ requires, so that whether or not I am able to go and see you, I will hear that you are standing firm with one common purpose and that with only one desire, you are fighting together for the faith of the gospel. Don't be afraid of your enemies. Always be courageous, and this will prove to them that they will lose and that you will win, because it is God who gives you the victory. For you have been given the privilege of serving Christ, not only by believing in him, but also by suffering for him. Now you can take part with me in the battle. It is the same battle you saw me fighting in the past, and as you hear, the one I am fighting still. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, we're going to sing again. You'll find the words on the order of service in Christ alone. 
This particular song is in a much later edition of Songs of Fellowship, so you won't find it in the regular book, but I have put the words on the altar of service.
and saw some men standing there doing nothing. So he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard. I will pay you a fair wage. So they went. Then at twelve o'clock and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. It was nearly five o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing, he asked them. No one hired us, they answered. Well then, you also go and work in the vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. So when the men who were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more. But they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, while we put up with a whole day's work in the hot sun, yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, the owner answered one of them. I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who was hired last as much as I have given you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I am generous? And Jesus concluded, so those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. You've been standing for the gospel. Please be seated. The beauty of this story about the kingdom of heaven is that it simply turns the world's view on its head, completely upside down. The world's view is this. We should all work as hard as we possibly can. We should all work for all the hours that God sends and we should get paid for them. So the more hours we work, the more money we should receive. The more we do, the better off we will be. And even if that involves overtime, even if it means working weekends, even if it means working on Sundays, we will do it. God's way is completely different because God turns everything on his head. In God's world, everyone will be rewarded for what they do in this life, everything that they do for Jesus, and it doesn't matter when they start it. All will receive the same reward, and that reward is life, real life, fulfilling life, real life now and eternal life to come. In the story, the vineyard owner goes out at various points during the day to hire workers to work in his vineyard. And it was generally agreed in the marketplace that if people didn't have work, they would stop there, they would wait there, and people who needed people to work for them would come and find them. So each time he goes, he finds people, workers, standing around, effectively wasting their time. And each time he promises to pay them a daily wage, regardless of when they start. And that's really important to the story. So the first ones, very early in the morning, are promised a denarius each. A denarius was a silver coin, and that was the accepted regular daily wage of a labourer or a farm worker. The next group are promised 
a fair or literally a just wage for what they do. The next three groups were told the same. You will receive a fair wage for what you do. Now, when the work was done, all were paid by the owner. The last first. But they were all paid the same. And you heard them, didn't you? The ones who'd been working since the early morning were saying, well, we're going to get more money, or we should get more money, because we've been working longer. And lots of moaning and grumbling went on. But the owner said, it's my money. I can do what I like with it. Why should you complain if I'm generous? But you see, that is the human way. That's the way that people deal with those situations. But it's not God's way. God's way is different. The reality is that people are going to discover Jesus at different stages in their life. Not everyone is born into a Christian family and perhaps adopts that faith right from the word go. Not everyone becomes a Christian when they're a child or a teenager. Not everyone goes to church. Not everyone hears the word and makes a decision. And some people don't find out until later on in life. When the owner of the vineyard asked the people, why are you standing around here wasting the whole day? They said, no one hired us. Perhaps no one told them that there was work to do. No one told them that there was a path they could follow. It's the same in our world today. If nobody gives people direction, if nobody helps people to see the faith, then they might spend the whole of their lives standing around, wasting their time and never getting anywhere. And Jesus offers all the same reward, the just wage, the righteous wage for doing what we have been called to do. And as I said earlier, that reward is life, real life, total life, fulfilling life. And we shall all receive eternal life because we have given our lives to Jesus. No one will be better than anyone else. No one will get more reward than anyone else. It won't matter whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or a Christian for five minutes. Jesus treats all of us equally. We are all his brothers and sisters. We are all welcome. We will all be rewarded for the fact that we've given ourselves to him. There is no hierarchy in the kingdom of heaven. No one is more important than anybody else. There are no ranks. There are no systems whereby some people will be higher than others. Believe it or not, this is reflected in the Church of England. All clergy, myself included, receive the same stipend. Now, a stipend is not a salary, it's not wages. A stipend is an allowance which is paid to me so that I don't have to go out and do a regular job to earn money to fulfil my ministry. It's an allowance that allows me to spend my time, all of my time, serving you, serving the parish, serving my local community. And that stipend is exactly the same for every member of the clergy. Whether you're a curate or a rector, the incumbent of a church like me, or whether you're an archdeacon, or a bishop, or even an archbishop, the stipend is exactly the same. Now, archdeacons and uh, bishops may get paid a little bit more money, but that's so that they can pay a secretary, PA, something like that. But the stipend is exactly the same. And also, it doesn't matter how long you've been serving. So, in my case, I've been ordained for 24 years, but I receive the same stipend as somebody who's been ordained for six months. That's the way it works. In the Church of England, it is perfectly fair and nobody gets any more than anybody else. But of course, the world doesn't understand that. And if truth be told, um, there are some people in the church that don't really understand that. 
and feel that they should be paid a little bit more because they've been working harder at the job. No. Look at the workers in the vineyard. They all got paid the same regardless of when they started work. And it's the same for us in the church. Paul the Apostle, in his very inspiring letter to the people of Philippi, lives for Jesus. The original translation of that first verse I read out, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. For Paul, life meant Christ, serving Christ, fulfilling his purpose for Paul's life here on earth. And if that's true, it means death is a gain, it will bring more, because it means that Paul will be with the Lord. So Paul is pulled in two directions. On the one hand, if he can do more worthwhile work for Jesus, he wants to stay here in this world alive. But the other direction is saying he would rather die and be with Jesus, because death will bring a much greater comfort to him, because he will be with the Lord. What about us? Well, first of all, we should rejoice that we have been saved by Jesus dying on the cross to take away all of our wrong and by his rising from the dead to give us this precious gift of life. And death is the gateway to life. Death is not to be feared. Death is the beginning of life. Death is the beginning of eternity. So, don't be grumpy, like Jonah was. God called Jonah to go and preach to the people of Nineveh because they were sinful. So Jonah went and preached to them, and what happened? They repented. They turned around, they went in the other direction, and God forgave them and said he wouldn't destroy them. And Jonah said, well, you see, Lord, you know, you're like that. You're very forgiving and very loving. That's why I ran away from you in the first place. What's the point of me saying to these people all these things and then you don't do what you threatened? Well, of course, what Jonah didn't realise was that it was his preaching and his words that changed the people of Nineveh. God used Jonah to change them so that they wouldn't be destroyed. And God wants to use us to change the world. We have an immense amount of work to do this world needs to be changed. This world needs to be brought to its knees to realise that God needs to be in control. We need to change a world that's been locked in a pandemic of pestilence for six months. People have been living in fear of this plague that they believe will kill them. Now, if we've been shielding or if we've been inactive because of lockdown, it, it doesn't matter what we do or when we start doing it. We should stand up for Jesus and proclaim his love. Some of us can't do that, but we can pray at home. Some of us can be active in being out there with other people and talking about God's love. It doesn't matter how much we do or when we start. We are all doing the same thing and all of us will be rewarded by God with life. Nothing else matters. My old vicar in Walthamstow, when I was a, well, not just when I was a kid, when I was a teenager and a young man as well, he seemed to be vicar forever. Um, when he died, he was buried in our churchyard in, in Walthamstow, and on his gravestone were inscribed these words from Philippians. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Now, with that thought ringing in our ears, I'd like to sing you a song as part of my talk. This song actually comes from a very old book called Youth Praise, which I used when I was a teenager. I grew up in it. And one of the songs we used to sing a great deal on a Sunday night at our meetings was number, well, you haven't got the book, but it was number 267. All my friends will know that if they're tuning in and watching this on YouTube. And it's called For Me to Live is Christ. And I'd like to sing it to you.
Lord, teach us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let us not be intimidated by opposition or criticism. Keep us firm in the faith you have set before us through Christ who has triumphed. We pray for Christians in areas where they are oppressed, for those who face cynicism at home or at work, for all who are afraid to confess their faith. We remember those seeking to spread the gospel in non-Christian areas. This week we're asked to pray for the church in Rwanda, the USA, the Philippines, Zambia, Paraguay, Panama, Melanesia, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Japan, Tanzania, South Sudan, and Nigeria. And in our Diocese of Chelmsford, we pray for the Deanery of Rochford and the Right Reverend John Parumbala, the Bishop of Bradford. Lord hears, Lord graciously hears. Bless all employers with a spirit of fairness and grace. We remember all who have to queue for work. All who depend on social security. We pray for all who are without work, especially as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. For all those on low incomes. For those who cannot get work through prejudice, or protection rackets. May all who prosper be generous and willing to share with the needy. We pray for all relief organisations. Lord hears, Lord graciously hears. We give thanks for our own work and our own homes. We pray for all who supply us with the things we need. We remember homes where families go hungry, those who are in great debt, those who have had homes repossessed. We do pray for the work of our neighbouring parish, Andrews and Holy Cross, where they seek to get food to the hungry. We pray for all who are engaged in soup kitchens and food runs at present. We pray for homes and families where work has dried up because of the pandemic. Lord hears, Lord graciously hears. We remember all who are unable to work with disability. We pray for all who are handicapped, for all are permanently on sickness benefit, for the chronically ill, for those who cannot do paid work for looking after another one who is ill. We think of those names on our prayer list, people who are having specific problems at the moment. And we also continue to pray for those who are in hospital, those who are housebound, and we pray for the vulnerable, the aged, and those who are still self-isolating at present. Lord hears, Lord graciously hears. We give thanks for all who have been faithful labourers in your heart. We rejoice with them in your love and generosity. And we are members together of your eternal kingdom. We do pray especially for those who are bereaved, especially the families of those whose funerals are this week. Lord hears, Lord graciously hears. And finally, let's rejoice with some good news stories. First of all, celebrate the fact that Luke, 
Sarah and baby David were not affected by the explosion at Appleford Court. And thank God there was only one injury, and there could have been a great loss of life. We pray for them and for all the residents of Appleford Court. And also rejoice with a friend of mine, John Howden, who today celebrates 50 years as a priest in the Church of God. Lord hears, Lord graciously hears. And let's draw all our prayers together as we pray for each other and for those we have remembered today. Merciful God, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. few notices to share with you before we share the peace with each other and if I can find my notice sheet which is hidden here it is lovely now first of all thank you to those who were uh, here for morning prayer this morning and for those who are coming to our zoom evening service tonight if you want to tune in and be with us live then please let me know this afternoon uh, if you're not on our list, and I'll make sure you have the details, and then you can join us as well. Then tomorrow, Monday, is St. Matthew's Day, and we are having a, our Bible study group, as usual, but um, those of you that come to the Bible study group, I have um, two internment of ashes tomorrow, one up at Battleton Crematorium, and one up at St. Peter's Churchyard. So I've delayed the Bible study until half past two tomorrow. I hope you'll still be able to join us. I will be sending a link round for that. 2.30 tomorrow afternoon. Then our midweek reflection this week is on Thursday, and that will be at the normal time of 10 o'clock. And we'll be reflecting on some of the readings that we've had this week. Also, if you've got the notice sheet, you will notice that several days this week are called Ember Days. These are the days before an ordination. And on um, Saturday and Sunday, various people in our diocese will be being ordained as deacons and as priests. So it's a wonderful achievement, and they're having to do it by um, very, very small numbers of people in the cathedral, but it's happening. And let's pray for those people as hands are laid on them, and they're commissioned by the church to go out and proclaim the gospel to other people. Now, next Sunday is our Patronal Festival. Um, it's Michaelmas Day on the 29th of September, St Michael and All Angels. We're going to be celebrating that over the weekend, and particularly on Sunday. And we're going to have to do something special in our morning service next week. I'm not quite sure what it's going to be. There'll still be a recorded service, of course, at 11.15, um, celebrating uh, St Michael and St Gabriel and all of God's angels, all of God's messengers who bring good news to us. But uh, watch out during the week for what we may be able to do next week. Now, perhaps you'll stand and we will share the peace with each other. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. And of course, peace be with all of you who are not with us tonight. Now, we have a birthday to see uh, to today, and it was actually during the week, but uh, Rob, who's been um, tuning in uh, in the last few months and finding out a little bit more about Pitsy with Devendon and about all that we do, has celebrated his birthday. So let's sing to Rob, and if anybody else has a birthday, and I don't know about it, let me know this afternoon 
and we'll sing to Happy birthday to you. Jesus, as the hem of your garment touched in faith, healed the woman who could not touch your body. So may the soul of your servant be healed. For though I cannot receive you in the sacrament, I can, through this offering of my prayer, receive you in my heart. Grant this for Christ's sake. Amen. O Lord and Heavenly Father, we, your humble servants, entirely desire your fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching you to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all your whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Amen. going to sing our last hymn together, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land.
understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Stay in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ.